And now I'd like to introduce uh, the challenges. Uh, first up, um, we have Amelie Stein. Um, Amelie, can you uh, unmute your mic? I'm here, yes, thanks. Great, yes. now over to you. And should okay. I just send to all the mentors that you can just also say next and I will be happy to scroll through your slides. Excellent, let's do that next, please. So the motivation for this challenge is that we can now relatively easily sequence human genomes of say patients and well that's great that gives us a ton of data the problem is data isn't knowledge and interpreting any changes we see in these genomes is actually kind of hard and so in this challenge what we're going to try is to work on one sub problem of this which is just single letter changes in proteins and i'm going to give you some data that is based on protein chemistry and analysis of homologous proteins. And there is a couple of additional columns. So we know this initial data works well. There's some extra columns that we think you can probably use and you're very welcome to go and find other things about proteins from public databases or other predictors. And then the goal is make a predictor that is great at separating the harmful variants from the benign or harmless ones. Next. Yes, that is in, there's a bit more detail on this slide, on the data you have. I think this is most, I wrote this up mainly for the people actually doing the challenge, so it's somewhat technical. Basically, there is data that's already classified that you will have, that you can consider a gold standard. And then there is data that comes from population sequencing. So there's grown-ups walking around with it. Probably these variants aren't terrible, but it's not, it's not a gold standard. And this is basically the kind of data you start from. And I linked an article in the channel that you can use for additional information. Next. Yes. Here's one example of how we've already used this in recent research. This was published earlier this year or end of last year. And you see the two main pieces of information on the two axes of this red and blue plot. And so this is a relatively successful predictor, but you also see, okay, a couple of blue dots are on the wrong side, a couple of red dots are on the wrong side, so there's clearly room for improvement. And the other plot with the rock curves shows you the standard way of assessing, of, of assessing sorry, how successful you were, and that is also going to be the sort of main output, how you show us in the end how great your new predictor is. Next. Yes. That's the output, rock curves. That's the input. There is some details on doing this properly to avoid overfitting. Um, there is, there should be a link on the next slide where you can download the data. If there's any trouble with that, let me know. Just post in the channel, then I can post it there. And that is all, have fun. All right, thank you. Uh, and next up, we have Ivan. Okay, do you hear me? Yep. Excellent. Okay, and then, and do I see the timer? This is a project of a dedicated cluster predictor for breast cancer. And uh, let's move to the next slide immediately. Uh, it's a quite a narrow topic. And the overall goal is project will be just make a simple as simple as possible classifier for the novel classification of breast cancer. Uh, just for a brief drop up why we should speak about breast cancer, yes, it's the most common type of cancer of uh, the whole right? and at least in women. In, if you include men, then it will be the first or in second place because of prostate cancer and lung cancer. It has well-established and developed screening and treatment programs. So if a woman has, uh, is using screening program for breast cancer, we there have ability, if she has breast cancer, she will find it at first stage and will have very and very good prognosis. Uh, in most cases, breast cancer is very benign and can be easily treated if you catch it at early stages. And even if there is a second or third stage, the prognosis still is very good. But the problem is that this type of cancer is extremely heterogeneous and 
Sometimes these cancers are very benign, so that the human can live with it for about 10 years and there will be no problems. And some of them are of extreme danger, like for instance, heteropositive breast cancer. And if you do not use a specific pathogenetic treatment for this cancer, the patient will die in a matter of about one year, I suppose. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, uh, at the moment, several classifications for breast cancer. Yeah, so the point of the previous slide is that if you have quite, quite heterogeneous cancer, then you, what you would like to do with it is to make classification so that you can find classes that are very dangerous, the classes that are very benign, and uh, stratify the treatment strategies for different classes of this cancer. Several classifications already exist, but usually they, they are not enough. So those are examples with classifications on this slide. And what presumably I will be speaking about in this project is a novel classification introduced in the paper of Christian Curtis in 2012. She called it an integrative cluster classification. So what the authors of this paper do, did, they took 2,000 samples of breast cancer, used data of copy number alterations and gene expressions, made some uh, motor omics clusterization, and they came up with a classification of 10 different clusters. A very interesting point here is that the different classes of this classification, they have, uh, well, very biologically meaningful differences, and thus they can make hints for differences in treatment strategy. And it will be very, very good if we will be able to classify any new sample of breast cancer into this integrative class classification, yeah? The problem is that this classification was done on clustering and on two omics platforms. So I th don't think that actually in clinic, we will use uh, sequencing of both of these platforms for every woman, yeah? In best case, you will have some array or RNA sequence, not more. Uh, and next slide, please. The overall idea and the goal of this project is to make a classifier for this classification. With, next slide. Uh, the possible solution, as I already saw, was a paper that was published two years after the initial one about this classification. It was uh, Colleen colleagues, and they made a classifier for, for decorative clusters and they verified it on 7,500 samples. But it was about six years ago. Uh, it was usually done in arrays. Well, nowadays, I think that in most cases, they will try to use RNA sequencing. And there were actually no clear signs that we were trying to make a platform independent predictor. So it would be a good idea to do this classifier once again in a different manner. Next slide, please. I just tried to make uh, some example of pipeline that you will, can try to use, yeah? So just first, you just filter out some of the genes that you can use for the classifier. And after that, perform some feature elimination because uh, the initial, yeah, the idea is so you make a predictor that uses expressions of uh, RNA sec on, or an array. So you need to take some genes of the Really metabolic data set where it, this classification initially was done, eliminate redundant features because, of course, you will not use all 20,000 genes. So then, some as usual, uh, machine learning uh, pipeline just makes several draft models, test them, perform hyperparameter tuning. And after that, the most interesting from biological point of view part of this project starts because. Uh, you wish to make a kind of... Uh, I'm sorry, Ivan, we're out of time. Uh, sorry, but did you tell about one minute? Uh, yes, yes, I sent you a Slack message. Okay. But you'll be able to talk to these guys uh, subsequently. Uh, in okay, the uh, never mind. So next slide. I just Okay, the main output of this is the work model. Next. I still think that possibly we could my, may rent a remote server, but if it's possible, it'd be better to work on our laptops. Uh, as a data, it will be used uh, Metabake dataset with annotation, about 2,000 samples. And uh, we can use a list of preselected external datasets for external validation. Thank you.
Thanks, Yvonne. Next up, we have Yeppe Hallgren um, talking about protein origami. Are you here, Yeppe? Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Hey, guys. My name is uh, Yeppe. Uh, my challenge is probably one of the most uh, famous challenges within bioinformatics, um, specifically trying to predict the three-dimensional structure of proteins just from their uh, primary sequence, that is the, the amino acid sequence. Um, does this work? Next. Great. Um, so basically, you want to take this, this amino acid sequence and break this three-dimensional structure. Um, I'm sure some of you have recently heard in, in uh, 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 the news about people using their own computers at home to fold proteins, uh, specifically the corona proteins. Um, Many of, of, the sort of the most naive methods use uh, uh, energy functions to try to basically estimate the best fold of the proteins. Uh, that's quite uh, expensive time-wise and also computation-wise. Uh, so this challenge is more focused on sort of an alternative approach, which is uh, called machine learning. So it's basically, can we use sort of our existing knowledge about protein structures uh, to make better predictions about future proteins, such as the corona one, which we're not quite sure yet what structure they have. Um, so this challenge is specifically designed around uh, a, a framework I, I wrote called Open Protein, which uh, is basically designed to take care of all the other things than designing a machine learning model itself. So that means uh, data parsing. Uh, we use a, a data set called a protein net, which is actually uh, from the CASP competitions, if you know that, sort of an international competition in, in protein prediction. Uh, Open Protein basically allows you to define your model, uh, and then it will I'll actually just go to the next slide here. Um, as, as your, uh, your model trains on, on the predefined data set, it will actually visualize the predictions of your, your neural network. So here on the left, you can see a, a prediction. Uh, the, the green one is, is the actual one, and the blue one is the predicted uh, uh, structure from the network. Uh, on the right, it will show the performance of your network as you train. Um, so right, in machine learning, it takes quite a while to train, uh, but every iteration, you'll sort of get instant feedback of, of how well the algorithm is doing. And uh, at the bottom right here, we also have a Ramachandran plot that sort of shows how correct are your angle predictions for the particular protein. Um, what uh, we're looking for in this challenge is, is, is uh, not a perfect predictor. Well, we're more interested in coming up with new innovative ways that can actually predict uh, uh, structures. This could be new uh, designs of neural networks, uh, new, new designs of all types of machine learning uh, algorithms, whatever you can come up with. Uh, performance is not so important. Originality is, is, is what we're looking for here. Uh, in terms of submission, it would just be great to have a description of, of the algorithm along with some uh, predicted protein structures and some visualization of those. Um, there's some links here, but if you join the uh, Protein Origami uh, Slack channel, uh, I'll share them all again in about 45 minutes. Thanks. Thank you. And next up, we have Johanna Thiemann. Johanna, are you here? Yes, hello. Hope everyone can hear me. Oh. Can you click the slide? I don't. Ah, perfect. So my challenge is about uh, a question in molecular dynamic simulations uh, and exactly like how much data is there available, how much is um, out there, what kind of simulations are out there and exactly like um, if they are, how can we use them, reuse them? Next slide, please. So molecular dynamic simulation gives uh, valuable insights into the dynamics of, uh, of, of um, proteins, of any kind of uh, atomistic resolution. And it's like perfect in combination with experiments. The problem is that they are really, really huge files. It takes long um, to um, run the simulations to get those data to analyze. So um, it, those data is mostly shared like with plots or figures or something like that, but they are very dynamic and um, this would be amazing when we could share them in a better way. So many people are already uploading their data to like any kind of uh, data repositories or on individual research group websites. But the problem is like also in these general data repositories, they are not like somehow standardized or harmonized or validated, often don't have like really good flag files. So it's very difficult to even find your own simulation which you uploaded when you don't like explicitly um, hashtag your name in there. Um, but often, um, so often there's also like no metadata available, which in the end also does not help with finding the simulations. So um, all of this together creates like a huge barrier for accessibility, interoperability and reusability of the data because it just cannot be found. 
So um, the challenge, next slide, please. So the challenge is in the end to create a kind of lookup table or something, repository database um, where all those simulations which are out there, which people provide on their websites or in this way, um, are linked together. And um, this also in combination with a good description, which is then also like good searchable so that um, you can get an idea like how many molecular nums and um, simulation data are out there. And thereby you can also search and find out, for example, how much um, simulations uh, are people doing and sharing about um, COVID-19. So the idea, the challenge is to crawl specific websites, uh, institutional websites, or the web in general for specific files and keywords. And then also extract, um, identify, extract, and assign very descriptive and explanatory keywords which go along with those sites, which are on their website or which are maybe even linked on, on publications where they came from. Um, also important is like to have a good search of those um, required um, um, good um, data in there to not end up in the same situation which we are right now where we just like don't find anything. And of course this should be like fast and efficient because people are providing data ongoing throughout the year so it makes no sense like to have a yeah, stable um, database. Next slide please. Um, output requirements so how should the table look like so it can be any kind of so you can be creative and um, see what you like in the end at some point it would be great to have this as a website uh, but like for the challenge or like you can provide however you would like to have it so it should just be also um yeah in the best way to reach utmost people um then how efficient is your crawl in the end so how efficient are you to get information and you can use um this um your crawl your um get uh, your look at table your data on um covid19 related proteins for example to find like how much simulation do i actually get out of that and this also with different kind of um keywords so uh, proteins which are related or interact sorry one minute left okay thanks um Exactly, also including all the new work we have very recent out um, there now. And um, also, um, you should not only contain like big databases, but also individual research group, which is maybe a little bit more difficult. Um, yeah, so in general, it should um, help with um, acquiring like more fair principles. So next slide, please. And yeah, so resources, just like what you have, you love to brain coffee fun and if you have any question you're free to bug me anytime thanks thank you and next up we have Lars Jul Jensen so thank you very much yeah my challenge I'm Lars Jul Jensen my challenge is all about fake paper detectors so we want to find fake papers in the biomedical literature and in case you were in doubt then the photo on the right hand side is the best working station i already sorted that one out before i knew that challenge existed so next slide and the background the reason why we want to do this is as you're probably all aware the biomedical literature is vast it's so big that we don't have any chance of possibly reading it there's a new paper coming out on average every 40 seconds so that's why we're using automatic text mining. The idea is to simply have a computer, go through all the text coming out in the biomedical literature, extract the knowledge that is in that literature and put it into structured databases. However, there's one underlying assumption in that, and that is that what's stated in the literature is actually true. And that's something that none of the text mining methods really deal with these days. Everybody's trying to pull out what the text says without worrying about whether what the text says is even true. So what's become abundantly clear in recent time is that the literature is full of wrong claims, and that can be for a variety of reasons. It can be honest mistakes of scientists. It can be scientists doing somewhat sloppy work, underpowered studies, p-value hacking. You may have heard of all those things. But what we're going to focus on here is actually outright fraud. So scientists are under massive pressure to publish all the time. And for that reason, there are people who are desperate to publish. And when there are, where there are desperate people, you can be pretty sure that there's also somebody who wants to earn money on it. And that's in fact where these paper mills come into the question, which are basically companies that are spitting out hundreds of very similar papers, 
made with a cookie cutter method and selling them to scientists who desperately want another paper. So next slide. And what we have is a recently discovered paper mill from China where there was a total of 422 papers so far identified that came out of the same paper mill where scientists have paid to get their names on papers where they didn't do the research. Now, what's interesting is if you go look carefully at those papers, look at the figures and so on, what you'll find is that not only did they not do the research, the company that sold them these papers didn't do the research either. This is faked. The data are made up. It's cooked data. Call it whatever you want. So that's the situation we're currently in. So what we want to do, of course, is firstly be able to identify more papers from the same paper mill. Are there more things out there that we didn't find already coming out from these same people? And the harder one, can we identify other paper mills? I would be very surprised if this is the only one out there. Of course, identifying more of the same is relatively easy. Identifying other paper mills that are publishing similar papers, but not similar to these, is much harder. What we have as input for the method, aside from 422 papers, is basically publication metadata. Of course, we know where things were published, mesh terms, lots of different things. We have titles and abstracts for all of them from PubMed. And for the subset that is open access from PubMed Central, we have full text articles. We could also get article figures for the ones where we have open access text, but that's a lot more work. Next slide. So you can attack this problem in a variety of different ways. You can think of it as a text similarity task where you're trying to find more papers similar to these. You can think of it as a text clustering task where you're trying to find groups of papers that look suspiciously similar, like they're made over the same template. And you can look at it as a text classification task where you're trying to classify papers into are they fake or are they not fake? That's probably the most obvious way to go about it. Where we have PDF left. files, you can look at it similarly looking at things like image similarities to compare the figures and say, are they similar? You can do image clustering, image classification, and so on. Next slide. And the output requirements, really what we want ideally is just a ranked list of papers. We want to run this method on either all the full text articles we have access to or entire PubMed if you're just needing titles, abstracts, and metadata as input, and then simply rank the papers based on how likely are they to be fake? Or alternatively, if you take it as a clustering approach, give me clusters of papers saying this group of papers look like they're fake and from the same paper mill. That's it. Thanks, Lars. Next up, we have Lasse Folkerson. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, you're a little low. I'm a little low. I can speak louder? Uh, That's much better, I, much better. I think. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Lasse Folgerson. I work at uh, St. Hans Hospital, a psychiatric institution, and I'm here to present uh, art from your DNA. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, Lars, I'm sorry to say, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's really, really uh, bad sound quality. I think it's, it sounds as if the mic is blocked with physically with something or something like that. When we tried to sound check before, it worked much better. Yeah, I did, didn't it? I had my son playing around, maybe. Uh, okay. uh, if you could just speak uh, closer to the mic and maybe a little bit slower. so that Something like this? That's great now. Actually, this is great. This is great. Okay. So, let me, and this is still great. Yes, good. Um, so, actually, uh, Rebecca Garcia wrote this, and I think it's brilliant, uh, because it really is, like catches what I want to say. We have a lot of uh, letters in the genome, obviously. My challenge is very simple. I wanna, I wanna challenge participants to make unique art piece based on that human DNA sequencing, and that's it. Next slide, please. Um, the thing I want teams to do is to, I mean, I don't want you to just sit and paint something. I want, I want to use, I, I want to challenge you to use some of these really, really modern machine learning, AI methods to, to, to make something uh, that can make art on the fly based on human DNA. And, and I wanna be as broad as that on, on, on defining the, the, the challenge because really success, as I see it, is just evaluated as any other piece of modern art. You have to catch the attention of the viewers. And that's it. So as this I, I see as a very open challenge. Next slide, please. 
Um, I put up a few examples of existing uh, solutions here. And, and to the left, this is, um, this is actually something contemporary. It's a, it's, it's a restriction fragment southern blot, and they sell for like a lot of money. But it's based on, on ancient technology. Uh, we don't use that anymore. However, on the right, uh, th these are examples of things you can do with these modern, modern image generating uh, technologies. But the thing is, they don't use DNA. And that, that really is what the challenge is about here, to, to, to combine these two things. Use something with DNA, because people are clearly like, very interested in that for no reason. And then you can use something modern. So that, that really catches the, the challenge. Next slide, please. Um, I have a lot of detailed suggestions and guidance because actually I've been working a lot on, on this for a while. Uh, I just five minutes ago opened up my a GitHub uh, repository called uh, Hackathon Art at this this address and it's also on the Violet. Um, but, um, but you can read it if you are in this challenge and basically what it says is that for a while I have been running um, user surveys on a website that I run which is called Impute.me which is uh, used for personal genomics analysis. And what I asked users there was basically, how would you like to see more art-based or, or, or poetry-based anything um, uh, on this side? And, and, and I've been running that for half a year. Now that, that bar plot there to the right is, is the results. And what it basically says is that exactly this challenge is, is sought after. And, and this is why I felt that the hackathon right now was was exactly what was was needed now. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the thing that I have imagined here, and I want to really underscore this, that they are optional suggestions because creativity is the most important thing. But what I've imagined is that you have uh, as a first step. You can use, uh, you can make something that can automatically generate pictures using, for example, uh, these generative adversarial networks as input, um, and uh, and and that's just the working package too. And one, and I want to say, if you do that really great, that's it, that's enough. Uh, but but something more that I had in mind was that you could uh, train the outputting generator based on user feedback. And of course, we only have a weekend, so you're not going to sit and wait for users to give you feedback. That, that, that won't work. But, but I, I pre prepared some human example genomes for you as well, so you can kind of like play with it yourself. Um, and, and the idea would be for whatever team would win this, I, I would basically implement that on the Impute Me side. And then we will keep running it. And, and the idea basically is to, 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 to make a, a precision art module something that can almost upfront guess what would people most like to see. Next slide, please. One minute left. Okay. One minute left. Yeah. Next slide, please. Um, so this is my last slide. It's just the resources I put available. I, I put up a lot of, uh, I put up a, a cloud computer for each person because I know this of each team. Because I know these these kind of um, GAN network things, they, they they require a lot of computational power. So you can you can use that. You can also use your laptop. And then I provided you with just a few genomes, it's just so you can get started and, and try to test out stuff. And then I scraped some some images because that's a little bit boring and time consuming, and I don't want people to use that. And finally, I have a copy of Impute Me for you. And that that's resources available. And that. Uh, that web, uh, that GitHub repository, and also the BioLib bio uh, will give you more details. And that's all I have. Thanks, Lasse. Next up, we have Vanessa Yurtz uh, and a team of people from Novo Nordisk presenting a challenge. Mm, yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Great. Next slide, please. Yes, at Novo Nordisk, we're mainly um, looking at diabetes as a disease, but also obesity, uh, cardiovascular disease, and NASH disease, which is lipid disease. Um, next slide, please. Can we change this? Thank you. Um, so along those lines, our challenge deals with looking at the fat content in two organs, pancreas and liver, and we'll be working with the publicly available uh, GTEx dataset, which has the aim of understanding the tissue-specific expression, uh, gene expression profiles. 
So for this project, a lot of people have been uh, sampled in different organs, and we have tissue images available, as you can see on the slide, but also RNA sequencing data. So together with a master's student who's working with me, Jaime, we've trained neural networks to identify the fat content in these tissue images. Um, and Vanessa, I'm sorry to interrupt, this. but there is a lot of yes. static, and people posting on chat that there is a lot of static uh, happening for, with your mic. I'm not sure how we can solve it. Maybe if you can try to switch off your video, then the whole channel can be used for audio and the quality might improve. Um, yes, I will do that. I can also try to move a bit closer. Um, no, okay, it's not about the mic. It's, yeah, it's about sound quality. Just keep speaking and we'll let you know if it's yeah. uh, still not good, but I think it's getting better now. Okay. Um, I will just try to continue and let me know if this doesn't work. Um, yes, so we have um, identified the fat, which you can see as um, white color in these pictures. And we'll make those predictions available to you for close to 600 individuals. And then the idea of the challenge is to um, yeah, analyze this data set and uh, compare the fat percentage to other values like uh, gender, age, um, and the gene expression data, of course. Can we go to the next slide? To give you a visual overview of the range um, of values you can see here, this is liver tissue with very little fat and uh, up to 90% fat. And on the next slide, you can see the same for pancreas tissue, which also has a great uh, range here. Can we continue to the next slide? Um, this is just a written up uh, description of the challenge that you can go back to. I'll make the slides available to the teams working on it. Next slide, please. So I've put down some questions here to give the teams a bit of an outline um, on how to work on this data set. But basically, we are interested in getting an explorative analysis of the data because we haven't really looked at it ourselves yet. Uh, where you just look for correlations and associations. And in a second step, you could, for example, look into building a predictive model that can predict the fat content, or you could look for a gene expression signature or similar. Um, the next slide. Um, yeah, so we're just interested in learning more about this data set and, and what you can find in it. And of course, we're also very interested in following up if something interesting comes out of it. Next slide. This is a link to the GTEx portal where you can find the data and we will make the fact predictions available to the teams working on it. And in the next slide, I've given you some links with resources that you can check out. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Vanessa. And next we have uh, Victor Bustos. Hi guys, can you hear me? Uh, a little louder, I think. I should speak a little louder or you can hear me? Uh, or more. move closer to the mic, maybe. Okay, how about now? Is it better? It's better, yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I wanted to thank Dimitri and all the Bi uh, BiHack um, team for organizing this. This is great. I'm very excited to be here. Before I tell you about the challenge, I wanna um, give you something, a piece of knowledge that probably you don't know, is that we live in a very special time. And that is not just because of the pandemic that we're struggling with right now. It's because for the first time in human history, there are more 65 year old humans on earth than five year olds. And this is just one statistic that reflects how the age, uh, the population is getting older and older. Next slide, please. So um, I wanna tell you that Apollo Ventures is a venture capital that invests, but also creates biotech companies trying to solve aging as a whole problem. Why aging? Well, because we believe that understanding aging will allow us to prevent and even reverse those conditions that are associated with age. Um, why are we looking, or why am I interested in FOXO3? Well, it turns out that over the last 30 years, 
scientists have done um, massive, massive um, efforts to better understand the components, molecular components behind the aging process. And um, among the many different genes that they have identified, FOXO factors are always part of that. These are transcription factors that modulate expression of different genes. Um, not only that, FOXO3 is special because the evidence that we have for this gene not only comes from model organisms, it also comes from genetic variants in human populations specifically associated with long longevity. Um, and so the promise of these genetic variants um, lies on the fact that if we can understand the uh, variability and how these variants affect the function of these proteins already in human populations, this would potentially bring us a step closer to the discovery and development of novel therapeutics. How exactly do these FOXO3 variants in human populations confer longevity is still under investigation. However, there is still there is some evidence highlighting that uh, these variants can protect against cardiovascular disease. However, we don't know whether the opposite is true. Are there any other uh, variants that not only uh, that could make you more susceptible to cardiovascular disease? Next slide, please. Dimitri, there we go, thank you. Um, so in order to ask or to pose this challenge to you guys, we will, I would like you to use the uh, Gene Atlas database that is uh, derived from the UK data, uh, Biobank to access previously uh, performed uh, uh, genome-wide association studies on this uh, massive data set. And the idea would be to extract the data associated with cardiovascular disease and uh, related conditions such as heart failure, atherosclerosis, uh, and so on, and identify the genetic FOXO3 variants that are uh, present in, in each of those conditions, compare them to the top variants associated to that particular disease or condition, and then of course include some negative controls. Um, I have to highlight here that I'm not a bioinformatician, so my expectation coming into this is that you teams are gonna have to take the initiative and come to me with proposals, and I'll be more than happy to guide you on the biology and so on, but this is a very, let's say, extra challenge for you, as I'm not uh, going to be able to help you with any part of the uh, coding. Um, I don't know how big this would be of uh, um, how big this would be of a challenge. However, there are many ways that you can expand this. For example, you could include other genes, including other FOXO genes. You could uh, investigate exactly uh, what are uh, these variants. Are they part of introns? Are they part of exons? Are they part of promoter regions? Or you could also um, um, identify the um, association of FOXO variants with other indications that are part, in, uh, part of this uh, gene atlas database. Next slide, please. In terms of output requirements, as I said, there's no, there's nothing really fixed. Uh, I'm more than happy if, if you guys come up with something very original. If you want to do something artistic, uh, yeah, that would also be uh, very interesting to compete with Lass. Um, but um, the only thing that um, I can tell you is that uh, one of the main ways of visualizing these are uh, Manhattan plots. And what you can see here is an example of such a plot where in the X axis you have um, all the different chromosomes, human chromosomes. In the Y axis you have the negative logarithm of the p-value of the association of specific SNP variants to the particular um, um, disease that you're looking at. So the higher the, the dot, the higher the association of that particular variant with the disease. Um, however, as I said, this is very much open for you guys to explore and play with the data. Next slide, please. And in terms of resources, as I said, you're gonna be having access to the uh, Gene Atlas. If you were to require um, computing power, let me know, we can figure something out. Um, but besides that, I just want you guys to be, you know, fat, not as, sorry, I mean fast, <laughs> like uh, old flash over here. <laughs> And of course, have fun. Thank you. Thanks, Victor. And I think that's everybody. We're actually ahead of schedule.